uh, but I am now joined by uh, Paul Prescott, uh, who uh, wrote a, um, a really interesting, uh, really disturbing, really important article for, uh, for Jacobin about uh, Trump's NLRB. Welcome, Paul. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I've, uh, I've talked to, uh, to Paul before on uh, Dead Pundits about um, the, uh, the legacy of, of A. Philip Randolph, uh, which is in, in many ways uh, inspiring as far as working class organizing. This is incredibly disturbing. Uh, so this is something that doesn't get a lot of oxygen from the media. We've heard a lot. You know, I mean, if you think about the number of hours uh, of, of media attention that have been devoted over the course of the last four years to hysterical, breathless coverage of every twist and turn of Russiagate, for example, uh, I don't know that, I mean, I think the ratio is like 100,000 to one uh, between that mm -hmm. and anything like this. But you say in your article that in a lot of ways, the Trump NLRB uh, has waged the most aggressive assaults on organized labor in some ways that we've seen since the uh, since the great depression so could you tell us what that's looked like yeah and um and this kind of speaks to this idea of whether trump is competent or not you know in some ways i think he is a bumbling fool but in other ways he's kind of advancing mm -hmm. a traditional republican agenda very quickly and very effectively and even just based on who he's appointing um around him and, uh, you know, just for some context, the, the National Labor Relations Board was established in 1935 with the Wagner Act, which basically gave workers the right to organize. And um, this analogy may not be the best one, but you can kind of think of it as like a mini Supreme Court for labor. So, you know, they set precedents and they um, adjudicate cases that decide labor's uh, future. And, you know, the whole, this whole agency is supposed to be something that helps workers. That is the purpose. There is an interpretation out there that, you know, the NLRB kind of just co-opted worker organizing and diluted the militants. I mean, I think that's an important perspective we should all think about. But generally, by and large, you know, it's supposed to help workers and it has in the past, you know, and, you know, it, it could still in the future. And so, you know, the president is in charge of appointing people to the board. And so Trump. Uh, has appointed all pro-management people, people with a background in uh, defending management, no one with any background in organized labor or defending workers' rights. Um, so these are all those people. And the Chamber of Commerce literally had a wish list of 10 items they wanted, you know, that are their priorities for the future. I think they released this list in about 2017. And it included stuff like, you know, being able to give management the right to set bargaining units, limiting communication with workers, you know, limiting what they could talk about over email, things like that. Um, and so this board under Trump has pursued every single one of these wish list items. Um, some of them they've already completed, many of them they have, others are in progress. So, you know, they're literally doing the bidding of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I don't know if you want me to get into some specific. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, absolutely. So, so one thing you mentioned in the article, uh, for example, is that under previous precedent, uh, union organizers can uh, do things like leaflet in public spaces uh, at their at their workplaces, right? So, for example, um, if you know if you go to to Kroger, uh, you you might see like right outside the store places, uh, you know, which is still store property, but you'll have like the Salvation Army there and stuff like that. Right. Uh, and so in the past, um, that's, been, that's been seen as something that, uh, that unions have, uh, have a right to, to use for, for organizing uh, are those public spaces that are available to, to other groups. And you mentioned a couple of ways in the article that the NLRB under Trump has undermined that. Yeah, I mean, there's been some general bans where, you know, they'll still allow the Girl Scouts and the Salvation Army to um, be outside of, uh, you know, um, companies and, and spaces to uh, promote stuff and solicit, but union organizers are not. And um, there was a specific ruling about the, um, you know, cafeterias of public hospitals, which are public spaces. Um, and again, traditionally, organizers could go in there to organize, to talk to nurses when they're, when they're on break from their shift. Um, they got rid of the ability to do that. And, and I, I have a feeling it was very specific because um, nurses have actually been one of the few sectors that have been unionizing at a higher rate 
um, I mean, over the past decade or, or so, and um, recently there was a big victory by National Nurses United in South Carolina. It was, you know, the biggest union victory in the South in a very long time. Um, so, you know, they're increasingly unionizing. Nurses are seeing themselves more as workers and not professionals. Um, so I have a feeling this was targeted at that specifically, you know, trying to prevent this sector from, from keeping on, on growing. Yeah, uh, and and the NNU, I mean, is is a particularly uh, good union in terms mm -hmm. of campaigning for Medicare for all. You know, is one of the big endorsers of, of both Bernie campaigns. Right. Uh, so you know, so that that's particularly disturbing. Uh, and uh, you also mentioned uh, the issue that I mean, I, I think might like not be on a lot of people people's radar. Right, it might initially seem a little esoteric, but it's actually like really important about uh, defining what bar you know, uh, defining bargaining units, right? So basically, who can be in a union together and, right. and, and, and bargain together rather than having to uh, go to the employer separately with much less leverage? Right, yeah, and this is one thing, the NLRB under um, Obama, there was a decision in 2011 called specialty healthcare where you know, they said you know, workers and their unions, they have the right to establish uh, what a bargaining unit is. And it makes sense, because it also has to do with you know, the job. Like in my union, in the teacher's union, um, we're in the same union, but technically counselors are in a separate bargaining unit. Nurses um, are in another one because we have our own issues. So you know, it makes sense that workers should have that right to determine that. Um, but now, you know, one of the first things this new board did was overturn that decision. So it gives, employers the sole right to determine a bargaining unit and obviously they are going to use that to their advantage and to give one important example um in 2018 you have about 180 workers at a boeing plant in south carolina who voted to join a union um boeing as usual refused to bargain with them um, and when the case went to the court you know they added new criteria for what a, could constitute a bargaining unit and so they basically ruled that that was not an appropriate bargaining unit. So 180 workers that voted for a union could not have a union because of what the NLRB did. Um, and again, this is really un unprecedented that they're intervening this directly on the side of the employer. That was one example, but it's been extremely consistent. And there's also, you know, a standard practice. If you're going to overturn a president, you would need to at least have some kind of like public input, um, hearings. Uh, they've never done any of that for any any time they overturn something. And again, it's a hundred percent record on the side of employers. Like, um, so again, it you know, there's no mistaking that this is just an all-out assault on labor. Um, you know, and they're they're they know how to use their power effectively, and they're doing it with this board. Yeah, and and that the thing about bargaining units. I mean, I think it's really worth kind of underlining and circling a couple of times uh, because. I mean, if you just take a beat to think about that, yeah, I mean, if you're an employer uh, and, uh, and you, you have a, a choice between, okay, like, so what's the, you know, what's the subdivision, right, of the people, of the people mm -hmm. working under me who, uh, who can bargain as a unit, you know, with me, and then potentially if things go south can, you know, go on strike, uh, well, Especially because uh, I, you know, I think a lot of people are, don't necessarily track this, right? But I mean, the United States already has like some of the most anti-union labor laws in mm -hmm. the developed world, right? You know, like for example, it's legal to hire permanent replacement, you know, workers uh, during a strike. It's not legal to go out in a sympathy strike. So, which right. uh, which directly goes to the bargaining unit issue. Uh, because, well, I mean, take my old situation. I was a, for years, I was an adjunct at Rutgers, uh, and I was on the board of the, the adjunct, uh, you know, uh, the adjunct union there. Um, and so while there was, um, you know, the adjunct union and the full-timers union uh, were, um, were both in bargaining, right? If one of them you know, had had collapsed and gone on strike, it actually would have been illegal for the other one mm -hmm. to go out on strike in support of the other one, right? right. Yeah. Uh, and so, of course, your incentive as an employer is to try to divide that up, you know, in every possible way that you can. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to say, well, it's it's up to you now, essentially, uh, that that's a incredibly disturbing assault on on the right to strike, really, right? You know, because. Uh, right. 
you know, because of the intersection of that bargaining unit issue uh, with the uh, with the no sympathy strike uh, clause of Taft Hartley. Uh, but um, I, I guess the one thing I, I did want to make sure that we hit uh, before um, uh, you have to uh, you have to leave so we can uh, start our panel is this uh, is the intersection between labor law and the COVID crisis uh, because some of the um, uh, some of the NLRB rulings, like I think some of the most shocking Trump mm -hmm. NLRB rulings that you mentioned in the article uh, take place uh, at, that, at that intersection, right? So like just to get the ball rolling, one of the ones that you mentioned uh, was suspending all union elections and using COVID as a, as a pretext to do that. So like literally doing at the workplace level what like the coup government of Bolivia has done. Uh, right. Say, oh, nope, sorry, no voting, COVID. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, even though these elections could easily be held by, by mail, you know, and I mean, what's even more disturbing, uh, I mean, we all know what essential workers are facing in the workplace. I mean, there's huge amounts of cases of UPS workers and postal workers and grocery store workers. I mean, so the regional directors of the National Labor Relations Board have been told to dismiss COVID related cases against employers. Um, they said you're not obligated to bargain over paid sick leave or hazard pay. Um, you don't have to bargain over a temporary closure. So it's literally giving employees a free hand, do whatever you want on this pandemic. Workers can't do anything. And then if you're thinking, well, maybe you could speak out to the public, they even cover that, where they're saying this is not protected speech. So if you speak out against your employer to the public, to the media about a safety issue, it's not protected speech. So um, you really could be fired for raising safety concerns during this deadly pandemic. And, you know, we, we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last or how protracted it's going to be, but I'm, I'm sure you can imagine, and it's already happening, that people are going to be forced to go back to work before it's safe. And, um, you know, this just is another leg they're kicking out from under people for ways they could actually advocate for their safety. So, I mean, it's a pretty stunning ruling. And again, I mean, I'll, I'll get in my cheap shot here with the Democrats. It's just amazing. You would think they would highlight this stuff a lot. Uh, and, you know, I understand in one sense, NRLB is a little bit wonky, but you can frame it in a way to really expose Trump as a fake populist, clearly anti-worker. This is something he has direct control over, who he appoints. Um, you know, you can make that case, and especially to the union households that have voted for Trump, you know, voted for him in 2016. It's just incredible that they're not highlighting this more. Um, yeah, they could they're, even they're, they could even draw a contrast with Obama. I mean, they could mm -hmm. say, "Well, these are things they're overturning that were decent under Obama, and now they're doing this." So I, I truly don't get it. And there's even plenty of other stuff they've done to unions. Um, the NLRB does not cover the public sector; it's only private sector. But Trump has launched a whole assault on federal workers. Um, so yeah, it just doesn't get any any play in the media or from politicians. Oh yeah, and uh, and I should add, right? I mean, like uh, it just came out, I think about a day ago, uh, within the last couple of days, uh, Amazon uh, just uh, revealed that uh, some twenty thousand mm -hmm. Amazon employees uh, have uh, have been diagnosed with COVID, uh, and and so you you start thinking about that, and and you think about uh, everything we know about the kind of like dystopian like high-tech dickensian you know workhouse right. way that like uh those those amazon uh warehouses uh work uh then uh then yeah i mean that the fact that uh that that's not considered a protected speech that you know you can't be um uh, can't be protected uh against uh, against being fired for uh, for speaking out about that uh one right uh it's you know, I mean, where my, my mind automatically goes is it's like a pretty obvious way to to show up the massive hypocrisy of um, of Republicans who have, have made a big deal about caring about free speech when mm -hmm. it comes to, you know, cancel culture, et cetera, right? You know, that, uh, but, and then too, as, as you point out, right? I mean, I think, yeah, like some of the details are a little wonky, but I mean, there is clearly a way to, uh, to frame this uh, that's, that's visceral. Right, you know right. that that's, mm -hmm. that's uh, that you know that the the Trump administration you know uh, doesn't want people to be allowed to uh, to to speak out you know uh, you know against about conditions in their workplaces. The Trump administration um, 
you know, once uh, is, is using this as an excuse to stop workers, you know, from, from forming unions. Uh, and I think especially in places like, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin, you know, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, uh, that uh, where these, these, these crucial states that uh, Hillary Clinton won last time uh, and to a great extent, you know, because of, um, of disillusionment by voters in traditional democratic constituencies, right. uh, it seems like this would make a difference. Uh, and the way that they've just been relentlessly chasing this very small margin mm -hmm. of of, uh, of never Trump Republicans uh, at the at the same you know at the same time as as not making big deal about this uh, just just seems like political malpractice. Uh, right. So everybody should read. Uh, everybody should read Paul's article. Um, and I think. I mean this this is this is exactly why right like I don't buy into the sort of progressives for Biden line that you know Biden you know can be pressured to support, you know, anything basically, right? You right. know, like, uh, I, I think I think we could be absolutely honest about who and what he is, but at the same time, you can acknowledge that you have, that the Trump and Biden are both enemies and you can still make a tactical decision about which enemy you wanna be fighting with about which issue uh, for, for the next four years. And I think yeah. we should be able to, walk and chew bubble gum on that question uh and this this nlrb issue i mean for anybody certainly on the socialist left anybody who cares about class politics that should be absolutely at the heart of how we think mm -hmm. about this so could i add one just, just quick point that i think is important um i mean another issue this thing of independent contracting and personally yeah. i i think this is the biggest task the labor movement has to figure out um so when you're classified as independent contractor you're not covered Mm -hmm. by the Wagner Act. Um, and so basically you don't have the right to organize and traditional you know, labor law does not apply to you. And Department of Labor has, has estimated over 30% of workers are misclassified as independent contractors. So getting over that hurdle is huge for labor, for organizing in the private sector. And this board has also ruled that you know, if you misclassify, even if it's on, intentional to avoid unions, that nothing wrong with that, you know, no, consequences that's all fine so uh that that's huge um just on the labor law point like we we really need to figure out how to deal with this independent contracting problem in this country so that's that's central yeah and that and obviously that was a huge obstacle to organizing uh even before trump but right. uh but this this ruling that you're talking about um really creates this massive legal obstacle because if you if even being able to prove that their intention and in misclassified you yeah uh, was to stop you from from joining a union isn't good enough to challenge it that that really is just flat out saying is like yep no they're, they're just allowed to do this now right so um so yeah thank you so much paul uh yeah thanks really for having me yeah really appreciate you taking the time so uh is um uh paul prescott uh so the uh, the article uh, is uh, is called uh, Trump claims he's pro worker, uh, but his labor board is trying to destroy worker organizing. Uh, that uh, came out uh, a little about a week and a half ago in Jacobin. Check that out. Anything else you want to plug before you go? Um, not really plug. It just you know it doesn't take that long to vote. And I, I I've been telling people I'm a single issue voter in LRB this election, yeah. so it doesn't have to be a big big debate about that. Absolutely. A uh, hundred percent agree. That's that's also the way the, the way that I always I always frame that. That uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you, um, I mean, there are a lot of I think very dubious arguments flying around about the idea that um, that like small numbers of of leftists can can exercise some sort of leverage, you know, by uh, uh, by by withholding our votes. I think the historical track record is very bad there. Um, you know, I I think that. You know, if, if I if I lived in New York, uh, I, I would do the uh, the political uh, the political equivalent of you know smearing some shit on the prison wall, you know, by uh, by voting third party uh, right. as 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 a protest of, about just how bad uh, Biden is. But uh, but since uh, since I do not right, you know, I, I I will and I I would urge others in in swing states to uh, uh, close your eyes and think of the NLRB. But, uh, but thank you so much, Paul. Um, really appreciate that.